our own Juanita Hagberg. Juanita? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and thank you, Joe. Thank you, Pat. I'd like to thank my husband, Nils, for helping me uh, with the tech part of this presentation tonight. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you all for showing up. And I hope we all learned something together. Uh, you know, there's no one way to make art. And that's something I think we all need to remember as artists. Uh, we need to leave some room for intuition, for exploration, for experimenting with our art. And since Halloween is coming up, I think one of the things to think about that's really scary for a lot of artists is a blank piece of paper. Uh, we, we often look at something like that, a blank piece of paper, and we go, how do we start? What do we do? And so sometimes people really get stuck and they get in a little bit of a rut and that kills the creativity that they might have. So I, I always think you need to go beyond your comfort level. And the fact that if you change one thing, you change everything. Uh, Helen Frankenthaler, who is a really fine artist, said, there are no rules. That is how art is born, how breakthroughs happen. You go against the rules or you ignore them. That is what invention is all about. So I, I really subscribe and ascribe to that philosophy. I think sometimes we get in too tight a of a little box uh, with things. I like to see what watercolor can do. Uh, I like solving problems and I like to try new things. Uh, as Michelle said, I love to be outside painting in plein air. And then I go inside for a lot more abstraction. I, I never thought I would be an abstract painter, but it, it did come to me gradually. And I, the more I started understanding about abstraction, the more I started really loving it and getting into all the possibilities of what you could do. But when you're outside and you're painting in plein air or you're having some adventure or you're on a hike, whatever you're doing, I feel that that goes into your mind and it, you start processing that and it comes out. You know, when you're out playing or painting, you often have people come up to you and they'll say, well, how long did that take to paint? Uh, and for me, usually it's about an hour at the most, but I, I would say, well, an hour and say 60 years or more. And that's because whatever you see, whatever you experience, whatever you're thinking about goes into your mind and there is a possibility you can bring it out when you're trying to be more creative. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I always uh, base my paintings on those experiences that I have in nature and my emotions about it because I want my painting to be very personal. Uh, I like to paint what something feels like and not what something looks like. So it's a very emotional response to things. One of the most exciting things that happened in my quest to find different ways to paint and different substrates, different surfaces to paint on, was that I discovered UPO. UPO is a polypropylene, it's a plastic, and it uh, presents a lot of uh, opportunities and as well as challenges for the watercolor painter. It was really developed in the sign painting industry. Uh, and so, of course, artists always discover unusual things. So it's been taken over by, by artists who use watercolor on it and they use acrylics on it. Some people use oils, uh, although I don't think that's quite as many. Uh, they use alcohol inks. But me, I like to use watercolor, so that's that's what I use. You can also use other kinds of inks too. Uh, it's a non-absorbent plastic paper. So how does how do you paint on it? Well, paint sits on top and then it has to dry by evaporation. So you, when you're painting with it, you're putting on the on the paint and then it's going to be uh, dislodged if you agitate the paint or if you wipe it off. And that one of the neat things about UPO is that you can wipe it completely off. So you can have a painting that you don't like. You can wipe it all the way back to white. You can wipe parts of it back. You can you can start, stop, 
and so on. And and one of the things is that it does, uh, since it dries by evaporation, it's affected by humidity. And so if you're living in a place probably like Florida or some of the places down south, you are going to have to wait a little bit longer for things to dry. So it's another way to teach us patience uh, when we use this material. So let, I'm going to show you uh, <clears throat> oh, the downward. We're going to do the webcam because... I want to show you uh, some UPO paper. Now these are pads. Here's a pad of UPO, and this is an 11 by 14 pad. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And UPO is going to come in different weights. It's going to come in different opacities. So here, for example, it's going to bend. Well, you can see that it's not going to tear. Uh, it, it will uh, bend and it will uh, crease. So you have to think about that when you're working with it. So as well as coming in an opaque type, it also comes in a translucent. And these are, again, these are just small pads uh, to use if you want to do that. So this, you can uh, be able to see that, let's see. Let's do it here. You can see how it's translucent. You can still see those paints right through. So what would be the, the difference between using, why would you choose one over the other, I guess well, is my question. The translucent has, uh, you're going to be able to see the light coming through it. And so for some people, that might be an application that they want. I've used the translucent. Uh, it doesn't appeal to me as much as the opaque. And so I tend to just use the opaque uh, for the most part these days. But uh, if you wanted that sort of uh, sense of, of kind of glowing coming through it, light coming through it, that that would be a material that you could use. It, you know, it comes in um, different weights uh, from a more lightweight. This, this translucent is, is fairly lightweight. And you can get uh, different size sheets. The, the paintings that you saw behind me and that you will see again, those are like uh, 26 by 40 sizes. And you can also get rolls of UPO, which come like uh, the biggest, I believe, is five feet by 10 yards. So if you have a giant place to work, you could do some really amazing large paintings, or you could use that, cut it up. It's much more economical. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of options in terms of, of, of what you can use. The neat thing about you both. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Michelle. Is the paper the same or is it different than the other? I, I'm sorry. Would you repeat that? Are, not, are both sides of the paper the same or is one side different? No, they are the same. Thanks for asking that. And I, I need to remind everybody else, you can certainly put your questions uh, down and then Michelle will relay them to me. Uh, so both sides are the same. And uh, again, you can wipe off your paint after you put it on if you want to change that or uh, reuse that paper or you can turn it over and do it on the other side. Um, it's very economical in that way in that uh, it's it's not ruined if something doesn't come out right. And again, if we get about 25% of paintings that come out looking really, really nice the way we wanted them to come out, I think uh, we're doing a good job with that. Uh, and, and that's something that's, uh, you know, it's a positive kind of thing about the paper. So uh, it is... Uh, uh, it's it's uh, pH neutral, and it's uh, as I said, never the same look twice when you put something down. It's very intense and bold, and you can paint either uh, realistically or abstractly on it. Um, when I uh, paint, I don't use sketches and I don't use photographs. Uh, so that's just, again, the, the image, the thought, the emotion is in my head and it's going to come out. Uh, so I'm, I'm 
basing my painting on my memories or my responses to nature. So uh, the other thing too is, uh, I forgot to tell you that it, the work is gonna be painted flat and it's going to dry flat. Because why, if you've got water on it, if you've got paint on it, it's going to run down. So I'd like to show you some examples of my work. And I'm gonna show you a few paintings a little bit close up so that you can see uh, some of the texture that, that goes that can go into making UFO paintings. <clears throat> As you can see, you've got you can use uh, granulating paints. You can use water to tilt and mingle. Uh, and you, I think you can get a lot of intense color. I like the textures that you can get with Yupo. Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some of the paints. Another question that we have here, Juanita, is do you seal your finished paintings? Yes, I do, because uh, you're painting on plastic, you're painting on a very slick surface. And so the paint is going to be disrupted by agitation, as I said, or more moisture. And so if you don't seal your paintings after they're finished, uh, they can pretty much slide right off. Uh, so I, I seal them with... Uh, Kmart by Krylon. Uh, and then what I do is I don't like a shiny finish, so I do a Krylon UV resistant clear. And that's a matte finish. You could use, uh, you can use gloss. And, you know, again, it's up to you what, what kind of look that you like. But I like a matte finish because it looks more like watercolor on that. So in are, terms of, are any of those archival? The what? Uh, the sprays? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, they are. So, and, and they're sealed now. How many are, coats do you have to put? How many coats do you have to put down when I you spray? Put, I usually put on three coats of each. And, and one of the important things about finishing off with a sealant is, again, you've got a moisture that can still be in your paints. And so you, uh, you need to make sure that's really dry on the surface. I've heard of people who spray their uh, paintings with, a lot of times they'll go directly to like the matte spray. And then later on, when, when that dries, all of a sudden they've got crackling on their paints. So you've got to be really careful. There's not a lot of humidity and there's not a lot of, uh, you know, moisture still on your painting. I use... Uh, can, can you mention... Excuse me? Can you mention the names of the sprays again? Oh, Sure. I'm going to show them to you also. So, you see that Kmart Varnish by Krylon and Krylon UV Resistant Clear Matte. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, some people use a golden varnish and or a Liquitex uh, varnish. Fixative, you know, there's different there's different materials. These are the ones that I started out using, so I just I still use them. They work fine for me. <clears throat> so again, I would be really careful about having a dry painting, um, you know, and then not touching it once you paint it uh, while it's dry. So that's I think that's really important. So I use paints. I use uh, I use a lot of Daniel Smith. I really like Daniel Smith paints. Um, I don't mind Da Vinci paints. I use a lot of those too. Um, they're a little bit more economical. 
<coughs> Excuse me. And I also use liquid watercolors. Some of you know Dr. P.H. Martin's Hydrus watercolors. Uh, they come in these uh, packages, and I bet I didn't open this one. Yes, I did. Okay. So they come in these. You can buy them separately, or you can buy them in sets like this. They go a long way. They're totally concentrated, and uh, they're extremely vivid and brilliant. Uh, there's three different sets that have different colors in them. And again, based on what you might use, you might like to try those. Uh, I also use a less expensive one sometimes, which is Blick. It's a liquid watercolor. It's more of a student grade. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a dye-based uh, watercolor liquid. And it, it works well for certain applications too. So I use two paints. I use the uh, liquid watercolors and uh, two different kinds of liquid watercolors. The other things that you might decide to use, you might decide to use watercolor crayons. Um, <laughs> this set I've had forever, seems like. As you can see, it's well used. Uh, I would say this is probably 20 years old. Uh, I was using it before I even started painting. Um, so anyway, watercolor crayon is going to be water soluble and that's something that's fun to use. Uh, you can use watercolor pencils and uh, any kind of other marketing things that you want to use. You could end up with charcoal, you could, you could have uh, pens and uh, inks, all that sort of thing. I, I use um, foam rollers. I find the small one works really nicely. And I'll show you later when I when I do a painting how I use this. Um, I use that and I use tissues, tissues with that, uh, paper towels and um, my brushes. I use usually flat brushes when I'm doing UPO. So uh, there's some flats that I use. I like a lot. And I'll use something like a small round. I usually don't use bigger rounds when I'm painting with Yupo. Um, oh, and the other thing is you can also use you can also use the liquid watercolor uh, straight straight uh, from the bottle with the dropper. And we can use wax paper, oops, wax paper, plastic wrap. I think this uh, kind from Costco works real well because you can cut it. It's not going to stick all over the place. I wanted to show you also some of the uh, textures you might get from UPO. Okay, we we talked about using uh, plastic wrap, but I've also used plastic. So this is this is a, a plastic wrap. And this is uh, plastic. That you're only going to get a texture uh, where the plastic or the object touches your your painted surface. And uh, let's see. bubble wrap, different kinds of bubble wrap. As you can see, it leaves different kinds of things. And this is something that some people like to use in their paintings. Wax paper. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> kind of wild. A lot of different uh, possibilities again, where the the surface of whatever it is you're using touches that wet paint, that's where you're going to get a mark. 
Um, here's some, uh, oh, this was some rug backing, I think, and this was another rug gripper. More rug grippers, depending on how you paint, what you paint. I, t I tend to paint very organically and not geometrically, but you might want to incorporate any kind of these textural things in your painting, depending on how you paint and what you like. Now we got Halloween coming up. So you've got, uh, you have that, the fake um, webbing which tends to get all over the place. You've got the webbing that you can use and stretch out and you would wet this before you put it on. See that, there we go. Probably right after Halloween, you could buy some very inexpensively. They'll be getting rid of it. So here's some that's on here, pull it off. And again, if that's stuck, if that's stuck to, for example, to here, then it's gonna show up more. So it's gonna show up more dark. This is uh, some gauze. Hmm. Different types of, of things. And this is some cheesecloth. Different, now this is very, it tends to be, uh, look very light. So again, there's all those kinds things that you could use. You could even use paper, like a, a tracing paper or something to press that down and, and see what that looks like. Let's see, what is this? Oh, it's with some more wax paper. <laughs> well, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, all, the, all different kinds of patterns. You could mix things. So now, one of the things I will say about using uh, textural materials are that I, I kind of, I don't like to see paintings myself where you say, oh, wow, they used the, some kind of a grid on, on this, or they used uh, wax paper or whatever. I think it, it becomes more interesting when you actually go in and you, you paint further so that, it, so that that textural material is not so obvious. So it's not so much of a gimmick. And I don't know whether you've had uh, experiences doing that, but I, I just think it makes a lot of sense. Now, if, remember I said, you're gonna remove the paint by agitation. So you're back to the white paper essentially. Um, hmm. I'm just I'm just rubbing it that way. So, you know, you can't do this with watercolor paper. And you might want to, you know, see where it goes. Now it's wet over here. And so that paint is going to spread. Those textures remind me of uh, seaweed or coral or something. Yeah, you Something could, underwater. Yeah, you could do whatever, and your colors might, you know, work with that too. And you know, whatever. Again, I just I like to see you go further and not make it so obvious. So, I also want to uh, mention that uh, Mr. Clean. Good old Mr. Clean. Artists should have bought stock in Mr. Clean. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Clean Magic Eraser is really great. If you end up having a staining color that's not going to come off real easily by just wiping, or you've got a lot of layers of something on, and and the and it just seems to be sticking, you can use something like a magic a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. That works really well. Uh, you know, I I tend to cut them off, use them, or break them off, use them in small pieces, and do that. And then <clears throat> it also comes in a thin eraser, which is like an eraser sheet. 
which you can kind of bend around and make a little more malleable in case you wanted to get a little bit of a, uh, <clears throat> you wanted to go a more fine uh, removal of your paint. So I, I want to remind you that now, as I said, I I go out and I paint or paint, and then I I'm painting abstractly. But there's really no hierarchy in terms of of art and in terms of painting and what style you paint it. So if you're painting, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, more abstractly, that's not better or worse than if you're painting realistically. It's the the object is do a good job. So and so, uh, I think that's important. So I'm. I want to show you too. Water. I always keep a spray bottle of water, but you could just use water from a brush. And let's see what we got here. For more water. This is that liquid watercolor. You just pour in drops of it on. Yep. Now, if I if I put some, uh, okay, I didn't clean my brush. Sorry, I wipe that off a little bit. That's one of those intense colors. <laughs> okay. And let's just see. Okay, so that's that's the Blick watercolor. And it would help if I got one that was real liquid. Let's, see, let's do this. Okay, now that's Kate Martin's. You can see that that's much more intense. And, you know, some people like to tilt, mingle. <clears throat> if you go right next to your paint, it's going to bleed into that next area. So if you didn't want it to mix like that, you'd, you'd want to stick uh, a part or you might want to just do parts of it. Hmm. How long does it take to dry? Um, sometimes it could be fairly dry by tomorrow. Um, you know, it's pretty dry today and it's dry here. But if it's, um, as I said, in a humid area, it might take you several days. But what I, I would do, unless I had some real delicate part, I'd be painting a whole lot of something and then and then I will let it dry. And then I would come back and take a look at it, see see where I'm either, you know, am I finished or do I need to work further? That sort of thing. So we say we wanted some of this off. It's wet now, so I don't have to do too much to it, obviously. But, okay, so you've, uh, there's too much glare. All right, so you've gone all the way through and wiped that off. And that was a very intense color. So it it shows you what, you know, what you can do. I'm trying to get that glare off for you. There we go. There. And some tube paint. You're breaking up, Michelle. What? 
I'm sorry, Q-tips. Can you also use Q-tips? You can use Q-tips. Yep. You know, <clears throat> if it if you put a lot of paint on, uh, and it's real wet, I would uh, then I would let it dry somewhat, so that because uh, a little tiny Q-tip is not going to take off a lot, and I don't see any sitting right here right now. But you can use Q-tips when I use them. I would let my paint dry a little bit more. Now the nice thing is. You know, you could have that totally dry paint, like we were, you know, looking at over here. And you could just wipe it off again if you didn't like it. A little agitation and presto, it's, it's gone. Which, you know, gives you a lot of opportunities for changing your mind. And, of course, people can fiddle and fiddle and fiddle. And sometimes that's too much. But uh, you do have that possibility. So I would um, like you to uh, – uh, I'm going to show, show you what uh, I might be thinking about when I'm out in nature. We're not in nature right now, of course. So – and as I said, I don't paint from photographs and so on. But um, – I'm going to show you some images that might be out in nature and uh, you can kind of see what I might be thinking about. <clears throat> Do you use alcohol inks too? No, I don't. I just use watercolor. So if I were, let me get rid of the line. Um, if I were uh, out in nature, I might be looking, I'm always looking at rocks, trees, and water. So some of the things that attract me are, you know, the texture, the shapes, patterns, scale of something. And, you know, as I said, these, these things go into my mind as well as my emotional response to some experience that I had in nature. Um, but for me, it's, all, it's almost always rocks, trees, and water some sort and uh and so it's like if you're walking around something and you just notice a pattern you notice uh the texture of something you notice the way you know the other things in nature around it respond to it you notice how you respond to nature uh so that's the kind of thing that i'm going to be looking for and this one for example, is uh, reflections. And oops, I'm going to get that back. There we go. So I, I'm really intrigued by re reflections. And if I'm looking at them, I can sit there for a long time and be sort of mesmerized by the patterns and the uh, the way it they move for the, through the water and what colors of the water and uh, just how I'm feeling. And, you know, is the wind blowing it or is it a very calm, still day? Is it warm? All those kinds of things. And so I'm intrigued by the reflections, but I, if I wanted to portray this, which I will show you an example of in a minute, uh, it's not going to be literal. It's just going to be an, an emotional response to this experience. Now, in, in the painting that I'm going to do for you, I'm, I'm using uh, ultramarine blue, I'm using cobalt blue, Prussian blue, sap green, uh, undersea green, quin gold, raw sienna, and, I'm gonna, and those are all Da Vinci and Daniel Smith. I'm also using Dr. P.H. Martin, hydrous watercolor, carbon black. Uh, the painting I'm going to show you in a minute is is going to be a 19 by 25 Yupo, and I'm using one and two inch flat uh, paint brushes, and I'm using a foam roller. So I've speeded this up. This this took several days to dry and, and to work on. So I speeded it up so you can see 
you know, a fast, fast version. Uh, it's too early for your bedtime. So you need to keep moving. <laughs> And right now, I'm just I'm just getting some pain on. I'm thinking what I might have seen in water, so I'm I'm going to move some pain around the paper. Uh, I'm just you know just seeing how it flows, what's going on, and I'm not going to think about it. Remember that that white piece of paper is too scary, so you got to put some pain on right away. <clears throat> So are you using watered down paint or is it pretty much full strength out of the tube? Uh, it's just, it's in my palette and it's just full strength out of the tube. And this one I'm using tube paints. I'm not, I'm not using uh, the liquid watercolor except for one small part later on. Now, as you can see, when I use uh, a two inch brush, I'm again. I'm I'm mark making. I'm moving paint around. I'm uh, also. You will see as I do this. I'm using the flat part of the brush like this, but I'll also use kind of the end edge. Again, I'm moving uh, some values around, but I'm just playing here. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not having a specific image in mind, except for what I was thinking about looking at, uh, if I were out in nature, what I would have been looking at when I looked at those reflections on the water. So I'm curious, when you go to teach this, how do you mm -hmm. teach it? How do I teach it? Teaching what? Uh, more abstraction? Yes. Well, part of it is you get, as I said, you get paint on the paper. And people have different ways that they're going to approach abstraction. Uh, for some people, it's moving large geometric shapes around. For others, it's putting paint on, and then they're very intuitive and they're going to respond to the paint. And I'm doing, part of it is I'm thinking of maybe shapes and uh, values and sizes and so on that I, I happen to be affected by when I saw the reflections. But I'm also, I'm thinking of how I want to balance a painting and how I'm going to have uh, lights and darks and big shapes and small shapes. And um, so I, I'm going to show people different ways of, you know, starting because there are different ways to start where people have different ideas about that. And everybody has their own style of what's comfortable. For a lot of folks, they they would just flip out if if someone told them to paint totally intuitively. It they would be that would be really hard for a lot of folks. So um right. <laughs> <laughs> Jumped ahead. How much? Um, 20 minutes. What? Trying to get it back up. So, yes. Where you? you know what? Um, actually, my, <laughs> my assistant told me that our painting jumped ahead a little bit. So, we're going to go back. We're going to a little further. Mm -hmm. I was saying we speeded it up, but I didn't think that much. So again, using the side of the brush and so on. You can, you know, you can almost do a whole painting using a large brush uh, if you want. And I think, I think one of the mistakes some of us make in watercolor is we start with a very small brush and that's 
you know, what we're doing instead of thinking about the big shapes and so on. <laughs> That's showing the whole picture. Oh. Yeah, we'll come down. Are you sure? That's my job. Marion would like to know how long did it take you in real time to paint this particular painting? Uh, it probably took me about uh, three and three hours, three and a half hours. Juanita, when you jumped to this section, or where it was a little further, was the yes. paint dry? Uh, yes. When I yeah. <laughs> but as I said, it didn't jump willingly. Or <laughs> <laughs> as I say, the first part, of course, I'm I'm getting paint so on. Paint... So do you paint some and then let it dry and then add more paint and or scrape some off? Um, yeah, uh, because it, it, you'll see as I move along, if we could see the whole video that, um, you know, you want to, you want it to be somewhat dry in certain parts, depending on, again, how you paint. And then other parts you you want to have a moment to think about it, that kind of thing. Now I'm wiping off some of this, uh, you know, again, okay. I want to bring back some of it to white, uh, and light spots. So I'm doing that as I go along. Now I'm using a tissue to kind of blot and a roller of a three inch foam roller so that you can burnish the painting. And that's also going to dry some of the paint as you go along. So what does the burnishing do? It dries it and it kind of hardens the, uh, uh the paint as you go so that it's it's kind of sticking to itself you know it's sticking to the under layer of paint <clears throat> it's kind of sets it it's really funny that i um don't usually use these colors but Part of me is very intuitive. And so I started when I just started this, it was I, I grabbed for those colors because they made sense to me in terms of, of painting. Again, color is a real personal preference and people have their, their own colors that they enjoy using and work for them. And it's interesting because normally I wouldn't be doing circles either or ovals in this case, um, but the the paintings you saw behind me those were had circular motifs going along and for some reason those have just shown up in my paintings lately so this one uh same kind of thing it circles ovals in a different way now when i'm using there using some um quin gold you see how that will push the other paint away and so you can get some real interesting effects by doing that. <clears throat> now here I'm using a, like a one inch brush. Again, uh, switching off, uh, mostly I'm doing that two inch and and you notice that the paper will move a little bit. And I could obviously eliminate that if I taped it down, but I didn't want to tape it down in case I want to tilt uh, the paper so that it will mingle the paint more. Are you currently working flat? Yes, I always work flat with you, Bo. But as I said, sometimes you want to uh, be able to lift the paper and just tilt the paint, depending on what's going on in your painting. Uh, say I were like I showed you painting and it had a lot of blue and it looked like waves and so on. That kind of a painting, I'd want to be min mingling the paint by tilting the, the paper.
Mary Francis wants to know if you can use a hair dryer to dry the paint. Um, I don't use a hair dryer. You can use a hair dryer on low settings. It can push the paint around. Some people feel that uh, you change the structure of your paint when you use a hair dryer. I just don't use one. I let it air dry. Uh, and I've used a roller so I can burnish it, get some of the paint off <clears throat> that I don't want on there. Um, again, it's some of this is personal preference. I tend to like to be simple. <laughs> so uh, one more thing I don't need to do. So I'm just using uh, a paper towel, uh, you know, to, to push that paint away because I, I, you know, I want it to go back to light. And again, I'm playing with things. So, you know, this is not going along with, say, a photograph where I'm painting a very specific thing. This is coming out of my mind and this is painting what I'm feeling like on the paper and what I think is going to be looking good. Uh, and the painting start, you know, will dictate where it wants to go. Once you get paint on, once you get shapes on and so on, then you're working with that and not so much with the original intent you might have had. So I'm not worried when I'm when I'm painting this way. I'm not worried about um, is everything going to be perfect? Is it going to look right? Is it, um, you know, do I want this here in the final analysis? No, I, I don't worry about that. I'm just getting stuff on and then I will look at it and see where I want to go with it. But I'm constantly changing it as I go. And if you work this way, it kind of I find it very freeing in in terms of not having to worry about does it look like the photograph? Does it look like what I'm seeing out my window? Does it look like what I'm seeing on my hike? Um, it's it's strictly about the my feelings and the painting. What size brushes do you use again? Um, that's a that's about a two inch brush. <clears throat> And I use, uh, actually that one's about a one and a half. And the rest of them are two inch brushes. I use one one inch brush. And later I'll use a small pointed round. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be sure to pop your questions in if you have some questions. Do you get better at relying on your intuition the more you practice? Yeah, I think you get better at most things the more you practice. And, and of course, the more things turn out right for you, I think then that reinforces the feeling of doing it again. You know, the fact that you could take Yupo and say you worked, you know, you were strictly doing a lot of design uh, <clears throat> principles and uh, elements and so on. You, you know, you, you at least have the option when using Yupo that you you can look at it, come back. Oh, I don't like that. That's not integrated. That's not working. And, you know, you do it again or add to it. You're not stuck. I always get kind of mesmerized. How do you know what you've done? Pardon? 
How do you know when you're through? Uh, let's see. When I run out of pain, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I think it's when you you look at a painting, and and for this, I think you need to set it aside for a while. It's once in a while something you finish and you look at it for two seconds and you go, wow, that really worked. But in most cases, I think you need to set aside, you look at it, and part of it is intuitive where you say, does it look right? And other times you're looking at it based on, say, design elements and everything. Uh, it's, so you're, you're saying, is it balanced? Does it have uh, enough lights and darks? Is it, uh, you know, I, do I have a variety of shapes? Do I have uh, movement? Do I have uh, something different going on? But but having the two, say in this case right now, what I'm saying is that I've sort of got two sides to things going on. You have a left and a right. So that obviously, as I go along, it's got to be integrated into this. But but finishing a painting, whether it's on watercolor paper or uh, on something like Yupo or another kind of alternative substrate, is, is it, you know, can I do anything else to it? Do I need to do anything else to it? Or does it work as is? And it's like, if you, <laughs> Yupo, you don't have to do as much of stopping before it's too late. Watercolor, you tend to tend to want to stop before you've gone too far. So you have a little more flexibility with something like Yupo. The one thing, you know, about Yupo is that you, <laughs> it's so much fun <clears throat> playing with, you can get carried away with that too. You know, I'm dabbing that so I get some more texture going <clears throat> and uh, coming back to some lights. Juanita, in your workshop, will everyone be doing the same thing? Working um, off of the source? No. Now, there will be a lot of uh, individual styles and so on, and and we will be working with, with those. I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel with people, but show you some different options and opportunities. And, and enhance what you're already doing so that you can learn to take your work further. How do people take their work home at the end of the day? If they won't, possible. they'll leave it. They get to leave it there and you get to have a good night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have visions of things dancing in your head. Will they right. spray with a Krylon? Uh, not less, not, I, not unless it's finished. And, you know, maybe we get a day like they've had today or tomorrow out, out in Danville, but, um, Probably they're not going to be spraying it. We have to, we have to, you know, we're at the mercy of, of the elements. I don't know about you, but when I paint, I stand up. And one of the reasons is so I can get 
my whole arm involved, my whole body involved. And I can also get a look at what I'm painting and, and uh, it helps me to stand up. I think the fact that you can uh, <clears throat> wipe back to the paper is, is very freeing for a lot of folks. Would you say there's no such thing as overworking it with you, Bo? <laughs> you're, you're going, I think she's overworking it. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, there really isn't. You could go and go and go. And so think of think of the paper you'll save. <laughs> I love the complexity you're getting. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes when you're working on UFO, it's fun to if you take <laughs> if you take pictures in progress because it, things can change so much uh, between what you're working on and what you finish with. You know, of course, the other thing people can do with their paintings, with, uh, it, it, I don't like to crop, but people can crop them because you might find other paintings you know, embedded in what you've just done. I, th I do think, though, that working on UPO is really freeing for most people uh, in terms of just being able to put paint on and, you know, move your brush around, learn what your brush can do and figure out what you can uh, uh, accomplish with a lot of bold strokes and so on. Well, Nita, somebody asked if you could sprinkle it with water and get more patterns. Yes, you can. You can uh, you can do water when it's uh, wet paint, or you could uh, spray water when it, the paint is dry. And then what I would do is you spray it, and then you do a roller, foam roller over the top of that, and that will lift out the, the marks that the water has made. You can also spray with alcohol. Um, and alcohol will make sort of bubble effects. If we have time afterwards, I'll show you that. <clears throat> Do you use uh, granulation medium at times? No, I don't, but you could. Um, you know, you can use granulating paints. And, and certainly, depending on what you're painting or thinking about while you're painting, you might want to use more granulation, like if you're doing something like uh, waves or whatever there I just did some <clears throat> some water on on the uh, paper right now you're mostly using pure paint do you yep. ever do you ever dilute the paint can you go light different tonal values um you can you can and if you wanted uh, by the same token, darker, you're going to use more like fresh out of the tube or something like uh, pH Martin uh, liquid watercolor, because that's going to be a lot more intense.
as I said, you, I'm thinking about water, I'm thinking about reflections, but again, not in a literal sense while I'm doing this. But at the same time, uh, I'm also being guided by what the pain is doing and where the painting is going. There's that Quinn Gold again. I love the way that pushes <laughs> pushes everything else aside. Well, Nita, so uh, you pull lays flat. You don't have to worry about it buckling. No, nope, it it doesn't buckle. Like if you get it in a roll or keep it in a, a rolled up state rather than flat, it it will take just oh a little while to unroll and and relax okay. but as i said you don't have to tape it down some people do um i don't find the need and then if you see it moving around here and there it's it uh it's because it's not gripping you can put water on the back and that would add, that would keep it uh from moving around okay Thank more you. sometimes i get so involved with my painting i don't think about things like that so so i just move it back into position but you could okay. you could uh, make it a little easier on yourself if you just wet the back. It would it would just stick. Okay, thank you. Yes. You could also take your foam roller and you could burnish when the paint is more dry. And that it, it almost gets sort of like a smooth leather look when you do that, um, especially with certain colors. This is a part you might have seen before because it jumped ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> deja vu. Are you working perfectly flat, Juanita? Yes, I am. Yeah, it, otherwise your paints would run down, it, you know, especially if they're very wet at all. <clears throat> I'm thinking getting more darks in there now. And <clears throat> again, if I were working with more uh, uh, undiluted paint where it's straight out of the tube or something, then that would get darker much quicker. <clears throat> problem with working with UFO is say you had a part that was quite interesting and that 
uh, seemed to work out really well. And if, if you took it off, then getting that same thing back would be a little more problematic. I don't know if I missed this, but Michelle wants to know if you will be talking about using the principles of design when you teach the workshop. Yeah, and we're going to talk about, you know, getting more abstract and so on. Okay. And I know that's hard for a lot of folks. It was hard for me for a long time. And part of it was just a matter of personal preference. Um, I used to think that if you, uh, that, that abstract paintings were a lot of throwing paint against the wall. And that's, I think the good ones aren't that. And so we'll be talking about that and helping people get to be more abstract if that's where they want to go. As I said, that's not for everyone. So, you know, it, it depends on where you are with your painting and what your ambitions with your painting are. But there's lots of possibilities. So it, I think it's fun to try out different things and see where you could go uh, to expand your possibilities. And Shirley wants to know if the UPO is actually accepting layers of paint as you work. Um, it will, as especially if you do something like burnish, then you're able to get a, a layer. Now, I'm working pretty, um, uh, I'm not working very delicately. So some of that paint is, it's been quite disturbed on the under layers. Uh, but you can get, you can get more, more layers on the paint but a lot of the painting is direct painting. But in this one, as you can see, I'm, you know, I'm very vigorous with my paintbrush. And so I'm able to go over some of the paint, even with that style. That uh, when you do the, like a tissue and the, uh, on the, on the paint, and then you come back with a, a roller on top of the tissue or just a roller afterwards. Uh, that's another way you can get uh, layers of paint down and have them stick. Now I've gone to this that small brush for some detail work. Do you ever work outside, Juanita, to, to maybe help it dry? Um, no, I don't with you both. Um, you could. I think it would be easier if you were going to do that to do smaller, smaller paintings. And again, it would depend on the humidity of the day, and how much moisture in the air. There I'm using a little of the pH Martin, and I'm just using it straight out of the dropper. It's the carbon black. And I normally, I don't use black in my watercolors, but on the UPO, every once in a while, I don't mind it. And you're using it like a paintbrush. Yep. That's, you know, that's just one, one way to do that. Michelle wants to know what you're trying to accomplish with the details. With the what? With the details. Oh, with the details. Um, I want to get some more line going because I'm I'm thinking I'm getting toward an end of this. And so I want to get a little bit of line and a little accent going for some of the shapes. But as I said, this is all this is all very intuitive of what I'm doing. And so since it's coming out of my mind and I'm not looking at a reference, then 
you know, it's like, is this looking good? Is it balanced? Is it, uh, have, have I got enough lights and darks? Have I got enough uh, big, small and medium sized shapes and so on? So for me, when I'm doing an abstract, I'm still thinking about those kinds of things. For some people, they're not. <laughs> You must have a paper towel we can't see to to clean off the brush. Um, dipping in a water, yeah, probably. Yep, yeah. there it was. I just saw it. <laughs> Good eye. <laughs> <coughs> You know, as you, as you paint, even though you're painting, say, a uh, more abstract piece like this, you're still looking as you paint for things that are kind of odd. And, and to me, there is one thing, <laughs> maybe to some of you, there's more things, but there's one thing that's very odd to me in this one. And so uh, when I get to what I think is the end, I'm, uh, that's something I'm going to really evaluate. <clears throat> I'll tell you about that in a while. I'm using that small brush to get a little more definition in a few places. Here I'm just going to use uh, that tissue to uh, blot a little bit so I can get a few more whites going around. The other thing that happens, I think, when you paint with anything, but I think it can really happen with you, Bo. Remember, we were looking at textures and all that sort of thing. Um, sometimes you fall in love with a certain area because it looks so cool. It looks really interesting. It has a lot of movement. It's got just incredible uh, texture and interest, and yet it doesn't work in your painting. So, you know, you've got to be willing to get rid of it. <laughs> but uh, as I said, I think that can help uh, happen a lot when you use UPO because there's so many textural opportunities and and so on that you can get some very interesting effects, but they may not work with your painting.
Sheila says, great energy. Follow your intuition is quite the challenge. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. It just, you know, you have to let go. And that whole thing, even with watercolor paper, it's just paper. <laughs> and That's so, uh, you know, we're all so afraid of making a mistake. And yet, and what did I say? That dampens the whole idea of creativity. Um, <clears throat> you got to, you know, be willing to go further than that. And Shirley wants to know, if you add plastic wrap for texture, how long would it take to dry? Uh, I find it usually just uh, sometimes almost immediately, depending on, the, again, the weather, sometimes just overnight. Okay. And Michelle loves the colors. Oh, thank you. It's interesting because I don't often use a lot of uh, greens like that, uh, greens and blues. So it's kind of a, a, it's almost a high key painting here. <clears throat> so as I said, this one, uh, was about three and a half hours. But, you know, some people spend weeks on a painting or uh, days, that kind of thing. Some people are going to get a painting done in an hour or two. It, it all depends. And there's no one right or wrong answer. All the layers make it look a little bit like Gustav Klimt to me. Oh, <laughs> neat. Juanita, will you have a value shift as the painting dries? Uh, no, like, not no. not not so much as uh, on watercolor paper, because here, remember the painting, uh, the paint is sitting on top, whereas watercolor paper, it's absorbing the paint, and and so it's going to dry lighter. This is going to be much more true to what you uh, put on. So I'm trying to move that blue around and get that over that side of the paper more and kind of reflect the same uh, movement I had in shapes. <clears throat> okay, so pause it. Um, now I want you to look at, uh, the, this is where I stopped the painting and this, look at the bottom right and you look at that um, shape on the bottom right. To me, it's one of those things that comes up where all of a sudden I look at that and I go, oh my God, it looks like a snake's head or a turtle <laughs> head or whatever, you know? Uh, and so somebody else might not see that, but I, I see it and that would that would just drive me crazy to have that. So you have these little sort of anthropomorphic mm -hmm. uh, things that can appear in your painting. And that's something where you, you know, you put your painting aside, you look at it later, and you say, Oh my gosh, I didn't even see that in the first place. Or you might say, I love all that texture in in uh in that area. So I've got even though it looks kind of weird, I've got to leave it. Well, for me. As I said, that would drive me crazy. So I uh, I ended up changing it. And I'll show you what the uh, the last uh, final version looks like. <clears throat> I don't know whether any of the rest of you see that uh, little little thing. Not about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what uh, I ended up with. Oh, okay. All right, so I changed that. I got I got rid of Mr. Turtle or whatever he was in that, <laughs> in that corner, and the rest of it I I left. You're right. You have a nice balance with this. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so something like that can uh, <laughs> drives me crazy. So, uh, you know, I don't know whether the rest of you get bothered by things like that, but I sure do. Beautiful. Thank you. Very nice. 
Shirley Thank wants you. to know if you would typically frame after varnishing. Um, yeah, I I do it in different ways, and I'm I still go back and forth with what um, I like. I like a more contemporary presentation. Can you show me again? Uh, I like a more contemporary presentation of uh, uh, UFO paintings, especially the more abstract ones. And so sometimes, and uh, so sometimes I uh, do a, a an adhering to a board or a foam core, and I will just do it with a, a frame. However, there's there's a lot of issues with that too. If you adhere it, you've got to use something like a gel medium, and that theoretically can work or it cannot work. Uh, which which leaves a lot of uh, potential problems when you work with that. So I also use mats and uh, frames and and do it in a traditional watercolor way. So there's different ways to do it. I I think it would be fun to experiment and try just hanging it somewhere on a wall with uh, I don't know whether you do grommets or uh, magnets or what, but there, I know there's other possibilities that we haven't discovered yet. Well, Any other the, questions about that painting? Or painting? The, the painting behind you on your right right side. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> you can't see me. But the one yeah. on your, over your right shoulder. Is that, um, it looks like a rose. Uh, is, did you, was that something you were intended uh, to to do or did that just happen? It happened, and so I went with it. <laughs> okay, I mean it's really cool because you can you can see petals jumping out and yeah and uh, uh, shadow inside, and it's very cool. Thank you. Now that one I mounted on a cradle panel, and that's a twenty six by forty. So um, you know those are those are real big, and it's fun to work big. It, it's uh, totally different. A lot of times I'll work on something like, oh, about a <clears throat> uh, 20 by 26 or something. But I do like to work on the, on the 26 by 40s. If you have a lot of room and you have the rolls, you can roll those things out and uh, work really big. Wow. That, that fun too. Juanita, you said a cradle panel? Yes, wood. Uh, you know, like acrylic painters, oil painters will paint on a, a, a wood with a frame. Mm -hmm. Right. And so anyway, that's just called a cradle panel. And that's you, Paul. And that's you, Paul, behind you? That's done in you, Paul? Yep, you, Paul. Beautiful. I have wow. a question about the other painting. It looks yeah. so like a white hole instead of a black hole. But uh -huh. there's a softness on the outside. Do you use uh -huh. any... Um, spray bottles to soften it nope uh no that's mostly paint and then burnishing with a foam roller wow beautiful beautiful so different different kinds of looks i keep the that one with the uh hole i keep uh i keep thinking that that <laughs> that circle that hole ended up being very central and so i was kept trying to pull that out a little bit more uh, to the top to balance things, but I, in some ways I don't mind it. And actually, if you saw it in person, it would be a little less uh, intense of a hole. There's much more gold that's going in that particular shape. It's very atmospheric. It's hard for me to look away. Okay, <laughs> it'll, it'll pull you right in. It, right, right. Right. Pull you right, right in. That's for sure. Don't <laughs> fall in. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, are there any other questions? We have a few more minutes if, if people have other questions. Yeah, I'm having some technical difficulties. So if other people have questions, just speak up and ask, please. Sure, right. If uh, if not, I, ho I hope uh, that people will if they have some UFO in their stack, and most artists have things like that sitting around, if not, I, I would encourage you to get some and 
<laughs> mess around with it, that's for sure. And if you want to learn more about UPO uh, and you want to join us on the workshop we have in uh, uh, November, please sign up. It's going to be a lot of fun. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, I'm going to see you, you there, have... Juanito. Juanito, yeah, so... This is I'm Carol. I'm going to see you in your workshop. Um, I have a question about the, the demonstration you just did. Yes. It looked like you were done many, many, many times, or it looks like I would have been done many, many, many times. <laughs> and then you just keep going and going and going. And I guess I'm wondering, did you know where you were going? Or <laughs> did you just keep going until you felt satisfied? Yeah, to me, it wasn't finished. And that's why I kept going. Uh, but there is that play factor and you get in the sandbox of, of your art world and <laughs> you don't want to get out because it is a lot of fun and it, and you do keep going. But to me, it wasn't finished mm -hmm. and it wasn't finished even when I stopped because I, I kept seeing that animal head mm -hmm. in it. And that was really bothering me. So when I stopped, it was like I had to, I had to erase that, and get, uh, get rid of it. I had a similar question. I felt the same way that it could have been finished several times. And mm -hmm. I, you took out a lot of the complexity that you had created with okay. a lot of different places. And then about halfway or two thirds through, you took a lot of that out and almost like started over with a much smoother uh, 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 texture really, and much more flowing. And so you it really changed the, nature of the painting and, the, and so I was just kind of wondering why did you do that um it's it's, it's probably because I just I thought you know again painting is all very personal mm -hmm. and so if it didn't look the way I wanted it to look I was going to go mm -hmm. further now can you mess something up yep you can the nice thing about UPO is you mm -hmm. can wipe it off completely you could go back to a spot that you thought wasn't working and then you uh can keep going with it but yeah there, there are times when you do go too far. So that's always a possibility. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh -huh. Beautiful. A great demo. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Oh, thank you, Carol. Pardon? Somebody Juanita. has uh, put that they would like to see the final painting again. Is it possible to put that back up? Sure. We'll, we'll get that back up for you. You don't have it in your studio? Juanita. I do. I, um, hold on. <laughs> anyway, let's look at it there. It's easier to show. It's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, As I said, it's a little different for me in a way, but once I start something and I have something in my mind, I just go with it. So it, it's like, again, not, um, not one, you know, right way for me to do something. It's interesting seeing the granulation too now. Yeah, that really jumps out. Yeah. Really beautiful. Just gorgeous. Beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Good job. Can't wait for the workshop. Well, good. I, I, yeah. uh, I hope we get some more folks that will join us. It should be a lot of fun. And it's a, it, time, yep. it's a time to play. I always look at something like a workshop as a huge luxury um, because People have so many things going on in their lives. And I I personally paint every day. It's part of my life. It, it's part of just what I do. But a lot of folks have to struggle a lot more to get time to paint. And so, so being in a workshop is a time when you can really pay attention to your craft and to your passion. And that's Take what care I of yourself. Yeah. for people to do. You're right. That's so good. Mary Frances says, looks like a late Monet. It does. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's the thing, too. Who knows what goes into your mind? Because right. if you were looking at water lilies like Monet or you were looking at uh, reflections on a pond like I was looking at, um, <clears throat> I think, again, it's that. You know, it took me an hour and 60 years or something because everything that's inside your, of your brain mm -hmm. is going into your work, mm -hmm. I think. I agree. What's be beautiful I find about working. Absolutely. But I don't know if I can be heard. Um, yeah, we can hear you, Georgia. We can hear you. 
beautiful about working with that. You can certainly see it, especially you're looking at this distance, those beautiful pieces behind you. It's um, the joy of working with you, Paul, is almost having a sculpture-like ability because you are carving out. That's true. That's and a you're, it's a three-dimensional. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's, I think that's Georgie I'm talking. And she's uh, she's quite good at doing UPO, and I I think you're absolutely oh, right. You. The whole yeah. carving carving analogy is a good one. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I realized it until I I realized my secondary student studio was sculpture, and I that's why I find so much solace in this mm -hmm. because I feel like I'm sculpturing, and yeah. it's sort of, it's beautiful what you've done. Just a gorgeous presentation tonight, Juanita. Oh, really beautiful. Congratulations, you. hon. Great job. Great job. Well, thank and I, you. I did see that eye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's an eye. <laughs> it's an eye. You got to watch out for the corners of your painting. So they, they it happens wait all the time. time. You see an eyeball. That's why you have eyeball. to spray them. Keep them on the painting. Right. <laughs> anyway, so I I hope you uh, enjoyed tonight's presentation. I appreciate all of you yeah. for for showing up and taking the time to uh, be here. And again, it's sign up for the workshop that we're doing in November if you'd like to learn more about UPO. And it, it, finally, I'd like to, you to think about something that Andy Warhol said. He said, uh, don't ever think about making art. Let everyone else decide if it's good or bad or if they love it or if they hate it. And while they're deciding, you go out and make more art. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Oh, good to so, you. Oh, I love that. Thank oh, you, fantastic, Juanita. Thank oh, you. Thank you, Juanita. Thank you, Juanita. Thank you, Juanita. Thank you, Juanita. Bye. Bye. Bye.